Hey, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching Tesla Time News. Episode 210. On Now You Know. And we're brought to you by our amazing Patreon patrons. If you want to join our community, then head over to Patreon slash Now You Know and be a part of creating independent news every week. And we're sponsored by Lesser Evil. You know what? The CEO and founder of Lesser Evil has been watching Now You Know for years, and he drives a Tesla. Wow, small world. Yeah, and they're good for the world. Lesser Evil only uses non-GMO organic ingredients in their products. And they use more environmentally friendly packaging, and they compost their waste. You can find their tasty snacks at lesserevil.com. So as we all know, COVID-19 is going to be changing education a lot this year. Many students who would normally be heading into a classroom are going to be expected to perform at least some amount of learning online. Now, this is probably your teacher or professor's first time teaching online, but this is what Brilliant has been doing for years. Supplement your students' learning this year by going to Brilliant.org. They have a lot of useful puzzles and lessons on a variety of subjects focused around science and math. Brilliant has courses covering subjects that really trip me up in school, including Algebra 1 and Geometry 1, all the way up through calculus and differential equations. To support our channel and learn more about Brilliant.org, go to Brilliant.org slash now you know and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go use that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. And head over to ecoware.us, where you'll find new designs uploaded every week, and we carbon offset the manufacture, shipping, and life cycle of your purchase, and we plant a tree for every order. And I'm wearing a new t-shirt this week. Wow. This is inspired by uh, Jamie Foxx. Yeah, but you ain't no Tesla, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, good shirt. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's not for everybody, but hey, you don't have to get it. It might be relevant for the story. So uh, Lucid Air had their reveal on September 9th, and they revealed the Lucid Air and some more details about the car. So before we get to the price, let's talk about some of these things. The first thing they claim to have is the most advanced headlight system. Which is something you look for in a car. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, they also said that they have a 924 volt uh, architecture for the battery yep. and powertrain. Now, that's really cool if you think about it, because the higher the voltage, that means the faster you should be able to charge the battery. The problem I have with that is they talked about how they're partnering with Electrify America for the charging system. But Electrify America doesn't have a lot of high power chargers. I mean, they're talking about needing a like thousand kilowatt charger. I only think there's a handful of those on that charging network. That's a good point. I mean, but the other thing to consider is that at least the the first Lucid that they're unveiling here uh, should have a range of over 500 miles. So yeah. as long as you can get to that charger, which it seems like you can draw a pretty big circle there on the map, as long as you can get there, okay. They did talk about their 19.2 kilowatt Wonderbox, which is their bi-directional charger. And that is a really cool feature. If it really turns out to do what they say, which would allow you to charge another car or to charge up your house, um, that's what we've been talking about, vehicle to grid and vehicle to vehicle. Like this is awesome. Right, I think that one of the things that they mentioned here is having kind of an off-grid house um, that has no battery storage you drive up with your car that has 120 kilowatt hours of battery storage and, you know, maybe you've used 50 percent of it uh, just to get there. But for a small off grid house for someone who could afford one of these cars, it would probably last a week. Um, and you could also have solar on the roof, which could therefore be charging up your car, which at the same time is charging up your house if you're thinking about it that way. So those features that we talked about so far are kind of new features. And I'm really excited to see that coming from this car company. They did start following some of Tesla's playbook here. Um, they talked about that they're developing their ESS stationary battery, which would be a whole lot like a power wall. Mm -hmm. And they're also developing a business and utility scale battery, which would be a whole lot like the power pack. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And they'll be offering the first owners of Lucid Airs three years of unlimited charging at that Electrify America charging network. Now, important to keep in mind that Peter Rawlinson, who is the CTO and CEO of Lucid, was an employee at Tesla. From 2009 to 2013, he worked on developing the Model S. Well, according to Elon, he didn't help that much. In a tweet that Elon uh, posted about Rawlinson, it's kind of a scathing tweet of basically saying that he left Tesla before all the work was done on the Model S. And I mean, he doesn't usually go around telling big fat lies about people uh, all the time. So 
Yeah, I mean, Lucid really is playing up the fact that they've got Peter Rawlinson who designed the car and is running the company, and they've got a lot of money backing them from Saudi Arabia, but they are probably going to IPO at some point. And in fact, during the reveal, Rawlinson said uh, that within the next couple of years, they're thinking of doing an IPO. So investors out there, keep your eye on that as the Lucid comes out. Uh, maybe this is a company you want to think about investing in. Right. One of the other things that they touted was that uh, this car was 17% more efficient. More efficient than what? What? No, no. They just said it was 17% more efficient. Than what? And then the competition. Oh, okay. Who's the competition? It, they didn't say. Uh, it, it could be implied that it was Tesla, but we don't really know that for a fact. So let's just kind of go through all the specs here to make sure that we all understand the car. Yeah. So the first car coming out is the Dream. So this is the performance edition. This is going to have 1,080 horsepower, a 503 mile range. It'll come out at a price tag of $169,000. It'll be able to go zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds, and it'll have a 113 kilowatt hour battery. That'll be coming out in the spring of 21. Now that is expensive. It is. But keep in mind, you will be eligible for the federal tax credit of $7,500 here in the US mm -hmm. plus any state tax credit. So you might be able to get that down to say 159. So still really expensive. It is. Um, now, I think that you're definitely getting a, in some ways, a better car than the Model S. It doesn't have a faster zero to 60. It's, I mean, it's comparable, 2.5 right. seconds, but you are getting a larger range by about a hundred miles. Uh, Okay, but slow down there, buddy. What? Uh, I agree that the car in and of itself might be a little bit better specs, but uh, how about the charging network? You're going to have to use Electrify America. True. And Autopilot. Yes, it will have some parking functions and it will have LiDAR, so maybe it'll start to have some autonomous stuff, but I don't think they're going to be ahead of Tesla, who has way more data. Well, and especially probably not out of the box. Right. Um, in terms of the level of stuff that it can do. That's, I mean, that's that's a good point. So, the oh, and, and can I just, I'm sorry, but this has been stuck in my craw since they revealed it. Yeah. I was so excited about the Lucid Air for one kind of funny reason. What? The back seat. But what? I mean, it, it looks like a fine back seat. Um, it does look like a fine back seat, but they promised us this back seat, an executive back seat. Remember Whoa. this? This was during the concept phase. And I got really excited. I don't know why. I don't know why I thought I was going to be like shuttled around, you know, by by a chauffeur or something in my executive backseat. Right, you but, don't have a chauffeur now. No, but I don't know why. I just I thought like this is really cool. Well, I mean, it's just seats, though. I mean, that that could be an option in the future, right? Maybe, but they just dropped it. They didn't talk about right. it. Right. OK, so for people who are saying, OK, one hundred sixty nine thousand dollars is just out the window. It's too ridiculously All priced. Right. Don't worry. Yeah, there's the grand touring edition, which will come out at one thirty nine. Before incentives. Before incentives. It has an even bigger range, 517 miles of range, has 800 horsepower. That's plenty. Zero to 60 in three seconds. Same size battery. And that's coming out in the summer of 21. Now, if that's too rich for your blood, the Air Touring will come out. It'll have dual motors. It'll have 620 horsepower, zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds. That's coming out in late 21. And that's going to be $95,000. And if that's too expensive, don't worry. They have their base model Air. And that'll be coming out uh, in 2022, sub 80,000, they say, and all the stats on that are to be announced. Probably going to have a single motor, probably going to have less range because mm -hmm. it's probably a smaller battery. Now, there's a lot of like spec wild speculation out there on the Internet is, uh, you know, is Lucid a scam? Because they did put out an hour long release video. This was a long release video and a lot of it was just filled with marketing fluff. It's not to say that the cars aren't the cars. It's not to say anything else, but a lot of people very upset that this overly markety kind of uh, unveiling an hour long of just talking about, they talked about the stitching and they talked about the leather and they talked about all of this stuff that wasn't, you know, battery electric powertrains and stuff like that. Why does that make it a scam? I don't know. And I don't think that it is a scam. I mean, we actually have footage from uh, Paula and Tom. They were driving through Casa Grande and actually filmed the factory that Lucid is going to be producing these cars in. So at least there's a factory there. Yep. At least, uh, you know, I, I'm fairly confident that they're going to be able to deliver, especially for this price. Now, if they had said, the Lucid Air, we're going to release it for $40,000, I would have gone... I don't know if I believe you. It's great, but I don't think I'd believe you. For 169000 yeah, I think you can make pretty much any car you want. Yeah, and I mean, they also revealed photos of their SUV that's going to be coming out after the production of the Air Sedan, probably in the spring of 2021 or soon thereafter. So if they were unveiling their sedan, the Air, 
Why are they unveiling their SUV pictures? My guess is so that if you were kind of thinking of getting a Model Y or a Model X that you might be like, oh, well, probably Model X, let's be honest, mm. um, that you might be like, oh, OK, well, they're coming out with an SUV edition. I'll wait for that. So it's it's to kind of get people to wait for whatever the next thing is. Oh, that's pretty smart. Yeah. Um, but here's the question. Yes. Is this a Tesla killer? Hmm. Well, I think that it is more of a competitor to the to the Porsche Taycan because the Taycan's roughly the same price category. Um, it's got roughly the same specs. You could argue that it has better uh, zero to sixties and and top speeds and stuff like that. But I think that once you're in this kind of luxury top end car, it doesn't necessarily you know you're not going to be racing with it necessarily. It's more of a status symbol. It's more of a. It's going to be more rare. It's going to be definitely yeah. It's definitely going to be more rare than say a Model S, which you can now get for what like sixty thousand dollars. It's a really good point because a lot of people just don't want to have the same car that everyone else has. And in the beginning, Teslas were rare and they stood out, but now they're very popular. Right. So I don't think that this car is a Tesla killer. Um, I think that, you know, we've all kind of retired the term Tesla killer, um, mostly because it doesn't seem like any car company has been able to compete. I think it's actually a Tesla helper. Okay, why? Well, you get a Lucid, you uh, enjoy it for a while, and then you got to go charge it. And you find one of the few Electrify America stations and you plug in, and then you kind of realize, oh, I kind of get charging now. I didn't really understand that before. Mm. And wow, if I had a Tesla, there would be hundreds and hundreds of chargers to go to. So I think you start to enter the EV world and then your next car might be a Tesla. Well, and not only your next car, but say your significant other or your children. I mean, let's face it, you just bought a $169,000 car. If your if you're a wife or husband or, or children wanted uh, a, a car, you might be thinking, oh, let's move them towards electric. I'll, I'll get you a Model 3, I'll get you a Model Y. Um, that could be the direction that you're headed in. It definitely does seem like if this car performs well and if it's the best car that that person had ever driven before, um, they're definitely thinking electric. And then if you're thinking, OK, I'm not going to buy you another Lucid Air. <laughs> this is this is the tip tip top car. Um, what am I going to get you? Tesla. So this story surprised me last week. GM announced on Tuesday that it will be partnering with Phoenix based startup Nikola for a 10 year deal. The $2 billion deal will give GM an 11% ownership stake in Nikola, and GM agrees to engineer and build Nikola's Badger hydrogen fuel cell electric pickup truck, which is expected to be in production by 2022. Uh, well, hang on. Well, hold on. <laughs> well, hold on. Hang on. Hang on. What? Well, hang on. Well, what? Wait, what? They're going to what? They really what? G GM's going to build their, uh, their Badger pickup truck. Okay. Do you want to hear more? Oh, yeah. GM will also help with cost reductions for Nikola's other vehicles, including its heavy trucks, by using GM's battery system and hydrogen fuel technology. So, so the, just walk me through. How does this deal actually work? Okay, so GM will get $2 billion of Nikola's newly issued stock in mm -hmm. three chunks through 2025. Uh, there's really no risk for GM. They will get about $700 million or up to that amount from Nikola to build out and design the trucks. So GM is saying like, great, we'll just have a customer basically. And there's no risk to us because if Nikola goes belly up, uh, no harm, no foul. So Nikola is giving GM stock and $700 million. That's mm -hmm. both flowing from Nikola to GM. Yep. Okay. So it's, you're not, you don't have to be too uh, worried for GM here. Right. Uh, you don't have to be too worried for them. Although, let's talk credibility. So you gave some credibility in this deal, and that's why the stock prices of both companies shot up when GM says, oh, we think Nikola is a real thing. But I mean, is Nikola a real thing? Oh, what on God's green earth do you mean? Well, I mean this. Uh, a report came out from Hindenburg Research last week that talks about, quote, Today, we reveal why we believe Nikola is an intricate fraud built on dozens of lies over the course of its founder and executive chairman Trevor Milton's career. Unquote. Unquote. <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't want to get sued here. We're just Ooh. reporting on what Hindenburg Research has said. They but basically they said a lot. They did. They came up with a very long document. And we're going to go over just some tidbits here, but we're going to go even deeper on Patreon bonus stories because mm -hmm. there's so much to unpack. Um, I want everyone to keep in mind, Hindenburg Research is short selling Nikola. So you should take all this with a grain of salt because Hindenburg, by shorting Nikola, has skin in the game. A conflict of interest, you might say. They do. Okay, so with all of that uh, out of the way and understanding that we're simply reporting on what Hindenburg said and that you can take that 
whichever way you want. Let's dive into it. So Hindenburg continued, we have gathered extensive evidence, including recorded phone calls, text messages, private emails, and behind the scenes photographs detailing dozens of false statements by Nikola founder Trevor Milton. We have never seen this level of deception at a public company, especially of this size. Trevor has managed to parlay these false statements made over the course of a decade into a $20 billion public company. He has inked partnerships with some of the top auto companies in the world, all desperate to catch up to Tesla and to harness the EV wave. We examine how Nikola got its early start and show how Trevor misled partners into signing agreements by falsely claiming to have extensive proprietary technology. We reveal how, in the face of growing skepticism over the functionality of its truck, Nikola staged a video called Nikola One in Motion, which showed the semi-truck cruising on a road at a high rate of speed. Our investigation of the site and text messages from a former employee revealed that the video was an elaborate ruse. Nikola had the truck towed to the top of a hill on a remote stretch of road and simply filmed it rolling down the hill. Whoo, this is some spicy stuff that Hindenburg's bringing up here. Yeah, and I mean, if you're if you're saying, well, so far, Zach, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, meat to that. I just want to point out one one piece that has some meat to it. Mm -hmm. This is another quote from the Hindenburg research. Uh, they say, Trevor claims Nikola designs all key components in-house, but they appear to simply be buying or licensing them from third parties. One example, we found that Nikola actually buys inverters from a company called Cascadia. In a video showing off its in-house inverters, Nikola concealed the Cascadia Cascadia label with a piece of masking tape. Hang on. Whoa. Hang on there. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's incorrect. What? I, that is not masking tape. I, I That's gaffer's tape. No, I think the more important. Unbelievable. No. Wow. Hindenburg is just a bunch of liars. That is gaffer's tape. That is not masking tape. I, I, I. I'm, I'm outraged by this. I think the bigger point here was that uh, that's not a Nikola inverter. That's a Cascadia inverter. In fact, we went to their website and looked it up, and that's a Cascadia inverter, the RM300. But how do you know it's covered with gaffer's tape? Uh, just look at the picture. It's identical. But the gaffer's tape, which is gaffer's tape, not masking tape. Gotcha. I just wanted to... Lay that one out there on you. Right. So, so we'll be talking more about this on Patreon bonus stories because uh, there is a lot more to unpack. And maybe there's even more inconsistencies. We will have to see. But you might ask, how did Trevor Milton respond? And on Twitter, right as Hindenburg came out with their research, he said, quote, been working on a rebuttal of Hindenburg for 14 hours to provide a clear, factual, low emotional answer to the report. It will be out before the market opens and working through the night. I feel great about every answer. They wanted max damage. It didn't work. Now back to growth. So I was really looking forward to hearing his response to all of the points. Right. And here's what we got a few hours later. Trevor said, Nicola retained outside counsel Kirkland and Ellis LLP and authorized them to reach out directly to the SEC. The allegations are false and deceptive. On advice of counsel, however, I won't comment further now other than saying that we have involved SEC. It is in their hands and I have to let them run their process. I want you to see how I have addressed each point, but it'll have to wait to be until the SEC finishes their work. Let's be clear, Nicola approached the SEC, not the other way around. The author wanted a motion, and we won't give it to them. So I guess we're not going to get to see his responses. Oh, so okay. Gotta wait. Gotta wait. Yeah. So instead of just kind of coming out and saying, like, but this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and we went to the SEC, he's going, we lawyered up. Not going to say anything. But I do think we could get some first person reporting here. We've got Paula and Tom who went to Arizona and filmed the Nikola factory. Uh, uh, guys, you didn't show the part with the factory in it. You just showed a big empty field. Uh, that's that's where they're building factory. No, no, no. I mean, it, you, it, it must be somewhere else in the video. Or, or maybe uh, Tom and Paula weren't filming the right side of the road or something. Uh, what, per perhaps. Where is it? Uh, GM did respond, though. They said, we are fully confident in the value we will create by working together. We stand by the statements we made in announcing the relationship. 
So we're going to have to see how this unfolds. So let's just think about it from GM's perspective. Let's say, hypothetically, without saying anything for certain, let's just say as a intellectual uh, conversation that Nikola isn't what they say that they are. Mm-hmm. GM still comes out on top. They Do they still get the $700 million from Nikola? I don't know. Okay. This seems like a bad and idea. Here's the good news, though. <laughs> we will see. This is all stuff that will happen in the future. I am going to predict that probably Mary Barra is going to lose her job over this. Interesting. Because I got to believe if I'm the CEO of a giant multinational corporation, I should do a little bit better digging before I invest in a company. Hypothetically, in, Hypothetically. as an intellectual conversation. Right. Right. Yes. And if you'd like to share stories like this with your friends, but you don't want to share our whole one hour video, you can go to our Now You Know Clips channel where we've cut them up into little bite sized tidbits so you can share them. So new drone footage coming from the Fremont factory is showing the Gigapress, but looks like the Gigapress now has a friend. Yeah, looks like a sibling Gigapress. So there's two Gigapresses going in at Fremont. And thank you so much to Gabe and Cal for great drone shot footage uh, at Fremont. And during his uh, flyby, I don't think he even realized that there was a second Gigapress going in until he flew a more recent shot on Saturday. So now we've got footage here of not only the Gigapress, which is so awesome to see. And by the way, look next to the Gigapress. What do you see right there? Piles of metal. Yeah. What do do you think those piles of metal are? Oh, that would be those are Model Y rear body castings. Yeah. Single piece. Single piece. So. It's working. It's working now, whether or not they're going into Model Y as we speak. They might just be they might just be test pieces at the moment. Who knows? We don't know. But uh, we do know that now there's a second Gigapress being built right next to it. So these are the IDRA Gigapresses. Um, These are so big, they don't fit in the factory. So they're having to build basically roofs over them. Um, And this is super duper cool. Yes. Now, do you know how much force these things can put out? How much clamping force? Uh, No. How much? 55,000 to 61,000 kilonewtons. Now, we're talking clamping force here. So that is... For injection molding terms, the amount of force that you have to push in and hold the stuff because you're also injecting stuff in between the molds. You know, you have a little bit of space and then you're injecting stuff in there and you've got to hold it in there. You can't let it come out. Otherwise, ugh, the shape won't be right. Right. So that's why you need these enormous presses. Not only do you need a really big area. You know, you couldn't just build a set of plywood. It would break. You need really heavy duty stuff. And these are the biggest presses in the world. Yeah. Nobody else makes cars this way. (laughs) This is so exciting. This is really cool. And again, I just want to really shout out to Gabe and Cal for getting these awesome drone shots. Uh, Definitely head over to his YouTube channel and his Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Gabe and Cal. Yeah. I mean, you're going to want to watch these videos, not just for the Gigapress stuff, but also for the buildings next door to the factory down the street. Uh, They're preparing, remember the second floor edition? Um, That's being worked on around the clock. And we think that's where Battery Day is going to have its presentation. So lots of fun footage to watch. And there's so much stuff just laid out in these parking lots. Yeah. You could probably tell exactly what they're building just by looking at this drone footage and being like, oh, that's a hopper for this. Oh, that's 12 miles of cable. Oh, that's this. That's that. Really, really amazing and there's a And there's a weird thing on the roof of the building. We're going to show it here, uh, which looks like, I don't know what, what that looks like. What is that? Is that like a satellite I, hookup? I don't Someone know. Someone who knows, please like comment down below because I really want to figure out what that is. Yeah. All right. So remember last week we told you that uh, Tesla had authorized $5 billion worth of shares that they could sell. Turns out, They already sold them. But didn't they file the $5 billion at the market plan on Tuesday, September 1st? Yeah. And didn't you say that that was so that they could slowly sell at high market prices? Yeah, I kind of thought that's what they would do. But this, don't forget, even though there has been a dip in share prices, we're still at almost an all-time high for the stock. So this was a really good time to sell. I think this feeds back into our conjecture that Tesla was asked to do this by the S&P so that there would be more shares available for fund managers. So what happened was on Tuesday, September 1st, they were authorized to start selling them. It looks like as of Friday, September 4th, they were done selling them. Um, And this is probably what dropped the Tesla share price last week. Remember Mm -hmm. that it hit highs and then it dipped. That was probably them dumping the $5 billion worth of shares. And this was, I conjecture, all for the S&P 500, which I think is good news. I think this means that we're getting closer to inclusion on the S&P 500. Well, and also good news because Tesla just made $5 billion in cash. In cash. That's another positive thing because you could build 
a lot of gigafactories for that amount of money. Yeah. And they did that without many consequences. You could say, oh, well, the stock dropped, but the stock price can always come back up. And now you have $5 billion sitting in the bank. Get some more gigapresses. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so what's this I hear about Chinese Model 3s being sold in Europe? Yeah. So according to Bloomberg, China built Tesla Model 3s intended for delivery outside of the country will likely start mass production in the fourth quarter, the people said, asking not to be identified because the details are private. They said the markets targeted include Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, as well as Europe, where customers currently have to wait for a Tesla to be delivered from the U.S., Shipments could start as soon as the end of this year or early 2021, according to the people. I don't know who the people are. I'm guessing they're employees at Tesla. So this is interesting. Basically, every Tesla that's ever been delivered to Europe has been made at Fremont um, because there haven't been any other factories that make Tesla cars. China is the first new Tesla factory in the world. But people have been saying... This must mean that there's a weak demand in China if they're going to be exporting these cars from China to Europe. I don't think so at all. I think that's uh, I think that's kind of a weak analysis. Um, Tesla has to keep delivering cars to other markets, right? New Zealand, Australia, and so forth. And if they have to ship them all the way from Fremont, that's a lot longer distance than shipping them from China. So even if you have strong demand in China, you still have to siphon off some of your cars to go to these other markets. Wouldn't it be better to do that from Shanghai. I see. And I mean, let's flip it around. Let's say that the first uh, Tesla factory was in China and then they opened the new one in Fremont and we started doing deliveries from Fremont to Europe. People would go, whoa, that must mean that there's a weak demand in the United States. But that's what's happening right now. And we know that that's not true. So therefore, that argument doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, what helps the Fudsters is that there's no demand numbers. Like there's no tally sheet of demand. But what we can gather is there's high demand because Tesla's always production limited. Right. They've never had big parking lots full of Teslas sitting there, you know, oh, we can't sell these cars. Right. I guess we should do a sale. Well, in a story like that is going to distract from the really good news for Tesla, which is that they can produce uh, more inexpensive cars in China and ship them over land to Europe without having to ship them from Fremont down the coast of Mexico through the Panama Canal all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. They can just put it on a train and get them there. The big question, I guess, would be whether Europeans want a Chinese made Model 3 or an American made Model 3. And um, if they're going to be able to tell. Right. I mean, there are going to have probably different batteries in them. So that is a question. Maybe if you're a European buyer, you'd wait. I don't know. I don't know if it matters. Or if you'd have a choice. Right. I think that when Giga Berlin opens and Europeans have that choice, they're, of course, going to want ones made right there in the country. They'll be cheaper. There'll be no import tariffs and they'll be you know, delivered from a shorter distance. True. I think that Tesla would also prefer that as well. Um, but for the meantime, you have a up and running factory in China. You may as well be shipping them to Europe. And speaking of Europe, Tesla is going to be building more superchargers in European cities. Jerome Van Tilburg, the manager of charging infrastructure in Europe for Tesla, said, now as a part of our commitment to make Tesla ownership easy and convenient for everyone, including those without immediate access to home or workplace charging, we are expanding our supercharger network into city centers. Yeah, and I think he's primarily talking about urban chargers, which are those 72 kilowatt chargers, a lower power, mm -hmm. but you don't really need the power if you're stopping to go shopping and other things like that. And especially many European cities have f relatively smaller urban centers, which means that you could park your car and go walk to work. So you guys know that we're uh, Rivian pre-production holders here on the show because we want to be able to show you the first Rivians that come out. And of course, we get the emails from Rivian of their latest updates. And here's what we got in our inbox the other day. Okay, so I have to ask, why does Rivian keep showing us Rivians being put together as opposed to Rivians just driving around? I think it's smart, actually. I think it's to keep Rivian pre-order holders excited about the fact that their Rivians are on their way. They're being built. Something's happening. If they didn't show us this, we would just kind of think like, what's going on? I, I've been waiting and waiting and nothing's happening. I see. So this is to- they're hard at work. This is to show that they're hard at work. I don't know. To me, when I see something that isn't fully put together- it's kind of like seeing how the sausage gets made. Like, I don't want to know what it looks like on the inside. Like, oh, I'm, I I don't know what it is about it that just freaks me out seeing something that's not fully put together. I like to imagine things as they are like represented in a video game where there's nothing inside. It's just a solid thing. Yeah, but so you're saying you don't like to see like the Tesla Gigafactories making cars? I No, I don't like to see that either. If I'm being honest, I like to think of something 
as a as a as a object but that is. But you're an engineer. I thought you would love to see how it's put together. I do. That you're part so of weird. Me, that part of me likes that, but I don't like to see things. I, like I do like things being put together and how you make stuff. But when it's something that I want to have. I don't want to think about all the little bits and pieces on the inside that could that could rattle out. Interesting. Yeah. I kind of liked, you know, that they're showing this clean factory and all these well, you know, smart people well, putting it well, together. <laughs> clean factory. It's freaking empty. Like they're building one truck and it's everyone's truck, there. They're building my truck. I guess. I guess. But like everyone's there looking at the truck. And it's like when you if you look at like the Tesla factory, it seems like you could ask people and be like, what are you making here? And they'd be like, I have no idea. I just move stuff. Like I don't even think I don't even think about the cars here. They just are being made constantly. Tesla Time News is sponsored by Cybertruck Owners Club. There you'll find a crowdsourced reservation tracker that you can update and find your place in line. Check out their website for Cybertruck news, discussions, and community for Cybertruck enthusiasts and future owners. And they have a 3D configurator allowing you to visualize the Cybertruck in any color, wrap and logo, both on screen and in augmented reality. And speaking of the Cybertruck Owners Club, Henry, a member posted Tesla's project schedule and upcoming opportunities for Giga Austin. Yeah, so I mean, this is kind of Tesla's way of letting contractors know of what they can bid on. And so we get to see some of the dates. So first dry in is December 30th, 2020. So dry in from a construction point of view means the first day that the client should be able to enter the building. And what does that mean? Like then, then they can start building a truck if they can walk in the building, they come in with the sheets of steel and they start folding them like origami. Well, no, not that fast. But it okay. means that basically those are the days you can start, you know, having your furniture delivered and your machinery delivered. So if if, if things go according to plan, that could be the first day that like the factory is ready for build out. OK, but um, then what about the what about building cyber trucks? So first substantial completion should be May 1st, 2021. So that probably gives us an idea of when the factory should be ready for like actually making something. Which is really cool. Wow. So that could be when we start seeing Cybertrucks mysteriously roll out of the factory. Maybe. I think that's probably a little soon, but maybe it's pointing to the summer of 2021. Wow. Anyway, Joe Tegmeyer is a drone pilot. We look at his YouTube channel all the time. So go check out Joe's YouTube channel if you want to see some amazing drone footage of the Gigafactory in Texas being built. And I just want to say... I love watching the construction machines. Uh, Joe does a great job of just kind of sitting the drone there for a while mm. and doing these like time lapses so that you can see like the machine sped up. Because, you know, when you watch a, a construction machine in real time, sometimes you're like, I don't even know what it's doing. Because you're only looking at it for such a short period of time. Exactly. If only you sat there for a couple hours and watched what they were actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. And you can do that if you just speed up the footage. Exactly. And so like I know my nephew, for instance, would love to watch these, you know, construction machines. Um, your nephew? What about your son? I <laughs> love watching trucks do stuff. I've always loved that. Exactly. And according to Joe, uh, one of the construction timelines that we're seeing here is that as early as October, Joe thinks we could see the beginning of structures being built on the site. So wow. that's just around the corner. Yes. Um, it's so cool to see the layout of where the buildings are going. Check this out. This kind of gives you an idea visually of where the two big buildings should go. We can see them not only in this graphic that he made, but also just on the dirt. It looks mm -hmm. like that's the layout. Wow. And then there's also a new South Bridge off ramp being built on Highway 130. Mm -hmm. There's some footage of it being uh, laid out and planned right now. And then we hear from Joe that there's a North Bridge that's also being built. Um, I just got to say, Texas, that's amazing because here in our home state of Massachusetts, I think they wouldn't even begin thinking about building these off ramps until there was traffic backed up for like 12 years. Right. And everyone was just like, well, it's just how life works. And I also just want to say we are so lucky to have uh, so many awesome members of our community going out and getting drone shots of all of these amazing things that are happening around the world. I also want to thank Jeff Roberts, who also has a YouTube channel. He has been doing daily drone flights at the Giga Austin factory every single day, every single day. What have you done every single day besides go to bed? I right. mean, that's amazing. I know between Joe and Jeff, you're getting just amazing footage. You, you you probably know better than some of the construction supervisors what's going on on the site. I hope that the construction supervisors are Watching. using this. They're probably it. using that and being like, hey, what are you doing down <laughs> <Yeah>. there? <laughs> Dave, what were you doing uh, at four minutes in this video? You, It looks like you were driving and doing donuts. Okay, so remember last week, we talked about how Elon met with Herbert Diess, who is the head of VW, and they met at an airstrip in Germany and they talked about something and we conjectured they were talking about what? Parcheesi. Yes. And cooking and braves. No, we, we also really thought that they were talking about 
superchargers um, because Volkswagen's just coming out with their ID3 now. They're soon to be coming out with the ID4, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we were saying, wouldn't it be kind of a good partnership if Volkswagen would help pay for the Tesla supercharger network? And in return, Tesla would allow VW to use their charging network. Well, guess what happened? Look at this story here. We get word from Next Move in Germany. So thank you, Stefan, so much for this footage and photos. Stefan Moller was able to show that a VW ID3 could charge here. And that's a supercharger. Yes. So this could really point to that what we talked about last week could be real. But, but that was not the only car that could charge at the supercharger. You could also charge a Taycan, you could, which I know you're like, but that's also VW, but you could also do a Kia Nero, mm -hmm. which is not VW, and Opel Ampera E, which is essentially uh, the European Bolt. Also the BMW i3, uh, the Kona, the Renault Zoe, and also the e-Golf. So, I mean, all of these different uh, electric cars could suddenly charge at the Tesla supercharger network. Now, I don't think that Tesla ink to deal with all of these companies all at the same time. It's a bug. It must be a bug. So uh, that's weird, though. That's weird. Don't you think that that's a weird? It's not a bug. Bug. Can, can you guys see between the lines? Can you read between the lines here? They met. And I bet they didn't agree on everything. They probably didn't agree on the price. I bet VW, I bet Herbert said, oh, Elon, can we use your charging network? It'd be awesome. Well, you're probably going to create a bunch of demand for chargers, which means that we're going to need a, a big uh, outlay of oh, new no superchargers. No problem. We'll build like 10 more. No, 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 no. I, you don't fully understand. Uh, it's probably going to be a 100% capacity increase, which means that we're going to need to basically double the chargers, especially in Europe. How about 15? No, no, no. You don't. Oh, all right. Listen, I'll show you what I mean. So what I think could have happened is whether they agreed or didn't agree, whatever. I think that this is kind of and again, this could be a bug or could not be a bug, but is a golden opportunity for Tesla to show a the excitement of other ED owners using the supercharger network proving that it can work. So that way, because for the longest time, you just thought that if you plug those things together, there'd be an explosion. There'd be an explosion. Not the case. Now, you know that they're going to charge with every car. So what Tesla can do is start gathering data while they have this bug. They could be having this bug or not. There are going to be some VINs that are unaccounted for, and they can simply go, well, during the period of our bug, uh, we noticed it, an increased demand at all of our chargers by... 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever. So that can both inform where they might want to put new chargers. It can also say, hey, we weren't even telling people that they could do this. And we noticed a bump, which means that we can take whatever number we have, multiply it by 11, and that will be the number of chargers that we need. And then they can take that to Volkswagen, Kia, all these other companies and say, here is what we expect you to pay if you'd like to use the charging network. Plus, we also need to work out some way to uh, charge customers. I would also like to make a second conjecture okay. since I'm riding on the high of my first one. <laughs> uh, Herbert Deese was checking out the Model Y last week and he said some really nice things. He said, this car is for us in many aspects, not in all, a reference, user experience, updatability, driving features, performance of the top of the range models, charging network and range. So conjecture alert. Mm -hmm. So last week I conjectured that VW and Tesla might have been working on a deal to have VW use the supercharger network. And regardless of what Dee said, just to be clear, we just drove the ID3 and had a chat. There is no deal cooperation in the making. So let me conjecture some more. What if Elon was asking Herbert to come work for Tesla as head of Euro operations? But Zach... Why would he want to leave Volkswagen? Isn't he the isn't he the chairman of Volkswagen? He's actually been demoted. Everyone can, kind of forgets the news story that came out over the summer where he's been moved down to head of VW Group, but he's not the CEO of VW anymore. So he's been demoted. That can't feel too good. Right. And he's always been pushing for electrics. So wouldn't he make kind of the perfect uh, head of Tesla Europe? He knows everyone there. Yes. Yeah, he would just need to basically change offices and have almost the same job except working for a arguably much better company. Yeah, because like, why would you just meet someone at an airport? Like, that's kind of weird, right? That doesn't, you know, usually you'd be like, oh, come back to the headquarters. You'll meet all the guys. Yeah. Oh, you'll, we'll be in the boardroom talking about stuff, not 
in a car yeah, by the, ourselves. The two heads of the companies are alone in a car for a while. Right. Good conjecture. All right. But moving on from conjecture to some real life stuff, let's take a look at this new video coming from Volkswagen about the ID4. Yeah. So this is the ID4, which I'm confused. There's the ID3. What yep. the heck is the ID4? ID4 is the SUV. ID3 oh, is a right. hatchback. ID4 is the SUV. All right. So, right. This is launching on September 24th in Europe, and then it should come out in China, and then following that, the US. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about this video is we're seeing some towing. So, do we know anything more about towing? Yeah. So, it should be able to tow up to 1,900 kilograms, or that's uh, 4,200 pounds. Oh, that's pretty good. Which is pretty good. Perfect for Europe. It's perfect for Europe. Yeah, as we've seen, as we've been to Europe, and if you're in Europe, you probably already know this, uh, lots of little cars have tow hitches that you just tow around little trailers full of full of stuff. Um, and that kind of makes up for them not having any pickup trucks, yep. which usually drive around with no stuff in the back. So right. I like that idea. And I also like that um, they have the ID4 with a tow hitch. So GM unveiled last week that they have a new wireless battery management system and said that they will be, quote, the first automaker to use an almost completely wireless battery management system, or WBMS, for production electric vehicles. This wireless system, developed with analog devices incorporated, will be a primary driver for GM's ability to ultimately power many different types of electric vehicles from a common set of battery components. So remember, a battery management system, and we built one for this uh, battery oh, ourselves. Right. So yeah. I'll... All these wires coming off this battery here. Right. They what, all what do they do? lead to the battery, battery management, management system. system. So and what they did was basically eliminated this wire part. And do you remember oh. what the BMS was for? Yes. So this basically tells us the, the voltage of all of the cells in the pack, or at least uh, groups of cells. And that lets us charge the pack uh properly right. without you know blowing up any of the cells or having any of the cells die. Right, it protects the pack and lets you maximize the longevity of it and so forth. And the hardest part of installing this was, was the, the wire. wiring. So GM claims that with the wireless battery management system technology, it reduces wires within the batteries by up to 90%, resulting in either lighter or more energy dense battery packs. I mean, I could make that a wireless battery pack for you. How, how would you do that? I just take the wires and I rip them off no, that, and then Boom, that's, I just removed 90% of the wire. Uh, that's not how they did it. What did they have to do to make it wireless? They can't just, they didn't just rip the wires off. They have to put uh, like receivers and transmitters in there. Yeah, so here's my question. Uh, it sounds great to say that you've removed the wires, but like you just pointed out, you have to add some stuff back in. In fact, you have to add powered things back in. You have to have powered transmitters on one side and powered receivers on the other. So, it seems like it, right? So you there's weight there and mm -hmm. there's complexity. And so I don't know. I mean, yeah, it'd be nice not to have the wires, but then we'd have to have transmitters and receivers. To me, it just seems like you build better batteries with higher densities and then you don't have to worry about the wires so much. Yeah, and we're going to talk about this in Patreon bonus stories, but basically GM didn't come up with any of this. Uh, this was Analog Devices, a Massachusetts company. So uh, GM kind of just partnered with them and I don't know. Use their technology. Right. right. Yeah. So Uber has announced that they will help their drivers go electric with $800 million in funding. Woo! Great. What a relief. Yeah. I, I mean, you don't have to think about that anymore. I know. They're aiming for 100% drives to be electric by nice. 2040. Wait, what? Uh, by 2040. 2040, that's in that's in 20 years. Yeah, be 100% electric drives in 2040. In 20 years. Yeah, 100%. But that's that's 20 years from now. Yeah. What, I mean, but what, you can problem? say anything can happen in 20 years because you don't have to be right. But that's what they're doing. I mean, <laughs> but 2040, I mean, look, it's like if you hired a contractor yeah. and, and the, you were out there with the contractor and you're like, oh, great. So, um, yeah, we wanted to have this porch uh, with the wraparound. No swing. problem. No problem. I have it ready for you in uh, 2040. Okay, great. Twenty. I'm sorry. In, are, is that military time? Be completely finished. 2040. There's no 20 month and most months don't have 40 days. What are you talking about? Uh, the year 2040, your porch is going to be done. It's going to be perfect. But I don't even know if I'm going to be living here by 2040. Like that's 20 years from now. I hate this. But there is one little spot that I noticed that's actually kind of interesting okay. here, which is that they are making this new program called Uber Green and they're expanding into 15 more US and Canadian cities. And basically what they're doing is they're going to charge an extra buck to the customer. Mm -hmm. But the driver of an all electric car will get an extra $1.50 per ride. So I want to ask, 
Would you, as a customer, be willing to pay an extra buck to be in an all-electric car? And would you, the driver, be excited about getting a dollar fifty per ride? Now, I'm not an Uber driver, so I don't know, but I'd love it if Uber drivers could comment down below if that would be something that would actually make a difference. Do you think you'd actually want to go out and buy an all-electric car to Uber it? I don't know. I mean, as as a user, yes, I would pay a dollar more per ride. But do you think most people are going to do that? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Maybe when you're just trying to impress somebody, you're like, I'm doing Uber green. So Tasmanian reports that according to a presentation by German Minister for Economic Affairs, Labor and Energy, George Steinbach, Giga Berlin will have a capacity for 40,000 employees in three shifts. That is a lot of people. Yeah. There's going to be a train connection to Giga Berlin, and it's planned to begin in the summer of 2021, with Tesla producing 100,000 vehicles in the first year and then increasing to 500,000 vehicles a year. And Elon tweeted out, Bitte arbeiten Sie bei Tesla Giga Berlin, as wir super spot machen. I don't think that you said that right. And Germans, don't worry. He's never going to say it right, so don't even don't even bother, okay? Well, translated, it means please work at Giga Berlin. It'll be great fun. And then Viv said, promise that you will hold part of your opening ceremony speech in German. And Elon said, natürlich, which I think means naturally. I didn't look it up, so we could be completely wrong. And according to Teslarati, employees at Giga Buffalo are reporting that the factory is going 24 hours a day, six days a week to keep up with solar demand. And in fact, job listings on LinkedIn show that Giga Buffalo is looking for over 30 new positions. Wow, 30,000 new positions. No, no, thir- I'm sorry, 30 positions. But we were just talking about Giga Berlin needing 40,000 positions. Well, yeah, they're making, like, they're going to make cars. Uh, this is already big workforce. They're yeah. looking for 30 more positions. Okay. Um, now, the conjecture has been that this ramp up is for solar roof. I would argue this is also for version three superchargers, which are made there along mm. with power walls. So um, this is just good news all around. Yeah. I know we've been a bit jaded to SpaceX launches now that, you know, things that it's such a common occurrence that right. rockets can reland themselves. But Elon tweeted this out and I thought we should all just watch as a Falcon 9 is, as you can see here, coming back to Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is sped up a little bit, but we're getting to see in such high def this rocket doing such an amazing thing. It's gone into space, delivered its payload, Mm -hmm. and now coming back to Earth to be reused again. Right. I mean, this kind of brings me back to Douglas Adams where he's like, you know, oh, you might think that it's a a long way out to the, I think he says out to the chemist, which of course he's English, he means the pharmacist. Um, But that's peanuts to space. And yeah, this is sort of our first little of uh, foray. Yeah, this is like dropping the kids off at school. Um, it's it's dropping a satellite off in low Earth orbit. Um, that kind of, it, it's starting to change my mind of how I think about space travel because you see it all the time. You're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, low Earth orbit, whatever. Um, stuff that we were like, Sput, but, but, oh! <laughs> you know, back in the day. I think that it's really awesome. Yeah, I mean, this is a Falcon 9 Block 5, um, and this is the second of two satellites for Argentina's space agency. All right, it's time for Going Green. The oil giant BP has entered into a $1.1 billion deal to buy 50% stakes in two U.S. developments for Norway's offshore wind company, Equinor. The deal is expected to close in early 2021. So the deal includes the Empire Wind Project, which is off of New York, and this should go live in the mid-2020s, and Beacon Wind, which will be built off of the Massachusetts coast. Together, they could generate up to 4.4 gigawatts, which is enough power for more than 2 million homes. Wow. Because keep in mind, the United States has hardly any offshore wind. We are so late to the game compared to, like, Denmark. And it takes BP to do it. Gross. Hey. Disgusting. They're they're pivoting. The Yeah, but they're pivoting. They're getting that oil is not the way to do it. This is actually good news. Sure, but it's also bad news because where where is everybody else? Into Into the future. future! All right, so this company, Gravitricity, is testing a new gravity energy storage system. Their lead engineer, Miles Franklin, explained how the prototype will work. Our demonstrator will use two 25-ton weights suspended by steel cables. In one test, we'll drop the weights together to generate full power and verify our speed of response. We calculate we can go from zero to full power in less than a second, which can be extremely valuable in the frequency response and backup power markets. This two-month test program will confirm our modeling and give us valuable data for our first full-scale 4-megawatt project, that will commence in 2021. So this is being built in Scotland, and this is a pretty cool idea. We've talked about it before. You take an abandoned mine shaft Mm -hmm. because you have to build an elevator shaft down to the bottom of the mine. Or you'd have to build up very high, and it's 
generally more stable to build on the ground and below. Right. So you take that existing mine shaft, which you probably would have had to, you know, fill in, fill in, and then you just drop some weights down and you generate the power. Then when you want to put power back in, you just pump power into the motors and you pull the weight back up. So it's uh, a really cool battery, so to speak. Now, I think that this is a good potential future technology. Obviously, there's other forms of energy storage, uh, like Highview Power has a you know, cryo battery, which is basically taking air and compressing, compressing it and, and you know, using cryogenics to actually make it a liquid. Mm -hmm. And then you can do that backwards. Uh, you can also do pumped hydro, which mm -hmm. is the same thing as this, only using water instead of concrete weights. Yep. So I think that a mixture of all of these things put together, they all kind of have their own benefits in terms of Although, scalability. Although I will say what I like about high view power or uh, gravitricity is that there's no environmental impact. So when you take water and you move it, you're actually doing quite a lot of environmental there's usually, potential damage. Right. There's usually stuff that lives in that water. Right. And so that creates some complications right. for sure. Um, and so here you're taking what we've already kind of done to the earth, which is sad, right? We've already done mine holes, mm -hmm. but you're getting to reuse them, which is kind of cool. Right. And I mean, and, and you can actually make new holes if you want to, but it's cheaper to use an existing one. True. And some of the first ones they're going to be building could be in Australia and South Africa. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. And now for a solar news update, we're going to call the spot Sunspots. Sunspots. That was from a viewer. Nice. That was a good idea. All right. So buildings and skyscrapers all over the world have windows, right? Yep. Well, what if you covered those windows with solar panels? Then you couldn't see out. It'd be very dark in the building. Okay. But what if you could see through the solar panels? You mean like a solar window? Exactly. And now this is not a new idea, um, but the the solar windows or the transparent solar panels um, have usually been pretty inefficient. Oh, so yeah. So we're talking in the one percentish area, oh. one to two percent. But a team led by the University of Michigan researchers um, have just cracked 8.1 efficiency for a color neutral panel. So it's like as clear as glass? Well, so it is 43 percent transparent. But most buildings have tinted windows basically to cut down on glare and oh. uh, extra heat being let into the building. Like in the summer, you don't want to just kind of have your building all heated up. So you usually have tinted glass on the outside of the building, but you're just throwing that energy away. You're reflecting it back into the environment. With these uh, panels, you could be both tinting the glass, but also generating power. So is that as efficient as it gets, though? Uh, no, actually. If you don't mind a slight green tint, you can get up to 10% on your solar glass. Oh, yeah, because who says it has to be like a dark brown tint? Now, of course, these are not as efficient as solar panels, but... But it's a dual use. It's a dual use. You're using it as a window. Most buildings, you can't clad in opaque solar panels. Right. It would be too dark in the building. People would be sad. Right. So that's cool. Very cool. And if you're thinking about putting solar on your house, the team at Energy Pal are energy geeks that help homeowners to go solar for less. So you can take control of your energy. You can guarantee the price of power and storage costs for 20 years, and you can do it all online on your schedule. Just hop on your laptop there on the couch, click the link down below and go to Energy Pal and tell them that Zach and Jesse sent you. All right, it's time for our video contributor stories. And how apropos, Joel in Iowa is talking about solar. And now you know community, it's Joel coming to you from a rooftop in Bettendorf, Iowa. I'm showing you my 7.4 watt solar panel system I just had installed. Just got turned on yesterday. It's uh, kicking out more power than I can use at this point. I got mine for about 160 per watt after incentives. Uh, Tesla has on their website right now uh, a much cheaper price, but they don't serve in my area. In Iowa, there's also an extra 13% incentive after that, so my total after incentives is only 117. Um, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is that the incentives are going away. This process took about three, almost four months to get done from quotes, people coming out to look at the house, and then another time was the utility company is real slow. By the time they looked at the plans and said, yeah, those are good plans, go ahead and do it. And then they only took one day to install this whole system. And then the system at the utility came out and looked at it to say, yeah, you passed inspection. Then they had to wait another time for them to approve uh, other plans and actually switch out my meter so I can give energy back to the grid. And now that that's installed, then I had to send someone come out and test it, make sure it works. Like I said, by the time it all got done, it was almost four months. So, so you might say, well, it's only July. I got plenty of time to do this. But if it took me almost three to four months in my area to get it done, and you wait a little bit longer, your incentives might go away. Because next year, it'll be down to 22%. And then the year after that, they go away altogether. 
And when I started this, I was as baby faced as Jesse, and now I'm looking a lot more like Zach. It takes that long to get it done. So if you're thinking about solar, you might want to do it now. Now you know. That's so awesome. Thank you, Joel. All right, it's time for our Patreon bonus stories. We got a lot to talk about this week. We're going to be talking about Hindenburg. So if you want to support the show and get some more content, head on over to Patreon, support us for as little as a buck a month, and you'll get to check out all of our Patreon bonus stories. See you there. All right, we're back from our Patreon bonus stories. That yeah, was a good one. It's time for our Patreon well, shout-out. the rest of the show? Yeah, it feels we, like we did a whole other Tesla time news. We did. We got more to go, though. Let's oh talk goodness. about our patrons who support us for $5 or more a month. Who do we got, Jess? We've got Terry Owen Saucier, Leon R. Bing, Roger Andreasen, Hervorge Depar, Brian Van Hooser, Julie and Renee Lindner, Ali Farhat, Hugh O'Neill, Tyler Saucier, Raymond Cam, Frederick, Ray Medina, Jeff Bontheus, and Teslafy AG. Thank you so much for your support. We can't do this show without you. All right, strap in. It's Elon's tweets of the week. Here we go. All right, so Elon says, if you bombard Earth with enough photons, eventually it emits a Tesla. Now, this was a joke told by one of the engineers at the Neuralink presentation, which I think is where Elon got the joke from. He also put AK in parentheses. I don't know what that means. No, what does that mean? I tried Googling it. You only get Kalashnikovs, so good luck. Or Alaska. All right, let's talk about the A-team. I mean, if you're, you're going to have an A-team. Wait, that's not the A-team. Where's Mr. T? Well, if you're going to have an A-team, you want the guy on the far left to be on your team. <laughs> Wait, this is the chess A-team? <laughs> yeah, this is Elon when he did was- Did they a... name themselves? Did <laughs> they, they name- They probably did. They're like, what should we be, what should we be called? And Elon was like, the A-Team. <laughs> and here's a picture of Elon. It says, Elon, what was the first video game you remember playing and what used to be your favorite game while growing up? And Alex said, that game appears to be the original Nintendo Donkey Kong handheld console. And Elon said, yep. So, <laughs> so, dad, every time I played video games, and you're like, son, if you keep playing video games, you're going to be stupid. I guess I was mm. wrong. I guess you was wrong. <laughs> and then Elon said, Tesla is best understood as a collection of about a dozen startups, mostly in series, increasingly in parallel. Every product line and new production system was invented. Instead of playing chess with the same pieces as everyone else, create new pieces. Boom. Boom. You should you should just say Sun Tzu. I mean, <laughs> wow, what a great quote. It, don't play chess with the same pieces, make new pieces. That's what I did when I played chess. I would say... <laughs> See this pawn? <laughs> Boom! All those pieces are gone. And the kid playing chess with me would get up and leave because he would be so disgusted that I would think that you could play chess like that. But why not? Monica Lewinsky tweeted, so very me, can't decide between a Subaru or a Tesla. I'm sorry, you said Monica Lewinsky? I did. And Elon and said, <laughs> try a Tesla and you're welcome to give it back if you decide you prefer a Subaru. Interesting. <laughs> this tweet from Robert Reich, he said, Tesla forced all workers to take a 10% pay cut from mid-April until July. In that same period, Tesla stock skyrocketed and CEO Elon Musk's net worth quadrupled from $25 billion to over $100 billion. Musk is a modern day robber baron. And to that, Elon said, all Tesla workers also get stock, so their compensation increased proportionately. You are a modern day moron. So, yeah, if every Tesla employee gets stock and the Tesla stock price skyrockets, even if you get a 10% pay cut, you... The stock increase, went up like four your, times. So. Your net worth will also quadruple... Well, not your net worth, but your um, stake just, in Tesla, Just right? to point out, Robert, uh, that means all of Tesla's employees are also capitalists. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> John McKay says, I used to think Elon was just trying to be goofy by putting biohazard mode in the Tesla. Ha ha. Now you can drive through farts. But this is the air quality inside of our house. So Elon, you evil genius, you win. We're going to sit in our car so we don't suffocate. And Elon said, we will make super efficient home HVAC with HEPA filters one day. What really freaks me out is that they don't make that now. Well, they're busy. Not Tesla. Oh, I wasn't talking about Tesla. I was talking about HVAC. Oh, yeah. I, like, I know that you don't go out and like buy an HVAC. It's not like you go to the store and you're like, I want that one. You like call a company and they make it for you because every house is different. I get that. But there is a portion that they do buy and that you could go to someplace and pick out. I mean, you can put HEPA filters in your- You can, 
but why isn't it just standard? Why isn't it just commonplace? And also, why haven't I heard more about that? It's just freaking me out. Uh, what's freaking me out is that Elon tweeted, many exciting things will be unveiled on Battery Day 922. Well, duh. Yes, of course. Of course. We're super excited. And Richard Reyna said, good day. What's your opinion about Bill Gates's declarations referred to electric trucks? Regards. And Elon said, he has no clue. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really... I'm really sick of Bill Gates being able to say whatever he wants and people being like, that Bill Gates guy is so smart. So smart. I mean, he came up with such a brilliant <laughs> operating system and now he's that the he richest, forced upon and us. And now he's the richest man on earth. And he gives so much to charity, even though he's the richest man on earth. It's like, what? Yeah. You can't write that. If I wrote like, there'll be a guy and he will extract lots of money by selling people crappy operating systems and then everyone will love him. You'd be like. Hang on, as your editor of your book, um, you're, this is moronic. Whole Mars Catalog said Tesla is now responding to traffic lights and stop signs all over the world. This stonk is so undervalued, Elon. And Elon said, and this still isn't using the dramatically better 4D, aka simultaneous surround video from eight cameras, architecture. Samir said, so by 4D, do you mean stitching the images of eight cameras into a single frame of frames 3D before labeling 4D? Nilon said, all frames stitched to single frame, tricky, as all cameras overlap in different ways, and then creating video segments for labeling and training. Everything from the labeling tools themselves to training to inference had to be rewritten. Brandon said, how's the rewrite coming? Elon said, releasing private beta in two to four weeks, public beta, early access owners who opt in, four to six weeks. After that, then all U.S. Tesla owners mid-December. Above schedule is contingent upon not encountering major unexpected setbacks. And Frank says, will this make tracking targets across all cameras more stable? Elon said, much. And Frank said, notice this problematic for long trucks that overlap across multiple cameras. Elon said, exactly. Problems like that have been addressed. And then Elon said, SN8 Starship with flaps and nose cone should be done in about a week. Then static fire, check out, static fire, fly to 60,000 feet and back. One way or another, excitement guaranteed. Support of Greater Boca, Padre, Brownsville community is very much appreciated. All right, it's time for Community Mail Time. Community Mail Time. This is a wedding that occurred in a Tesla. Congratulations to Tori and Anna. I'm, I'm, this is the first one that I've seen. Wait, so this is in Las Vegas? This is in Las Vegas. Remember, you've probably seen it before. It's that drive through wedding place. That's awesome. So our friend Elliot just got Tesla solar installed on his roof, and he has this cool idea, which I think is pretty smart, putting his referral code on a lawn sign out in front of his house saying, Tesla solar, use my referral code. And save some money. And save some money. So this would be free advertising for Tesla. If Tesla does should it. just do this for you. Y yeah, you should be like, hey, I'd like a lawn sign. And they'd I mean, say, absolutely. Solar City used to have lawn signs, so I bet they would do this. Tesla, right. let's and, let's do it. And now you'd have a, a referral code, so there'd be a reason to use it. I mean, if you put us in charge of VP of operations, we would take care of this. Special operations. Yes. yes. Special, <laughs> special, secret, top secret operations. Yes. And then, yes, that is an Arkimoto on the back of a truck in Eugene, Oregon. Now, look at the forest fires. So, I mean, they're they're leaving, but they're not <laughs> leaving their Arkimoto. <laughs> And then our friend Tim in Oregon, he said, Zach and Jesse, I'm writing to you from Ashland, Oregon. We are staying inside since the air quality index is currently over 400, which is extremely hazardous. As most of you know, Oregon is dealing with devastating wildfires and about 12% of the state's population is under some form of evacuation orders. A few days ago, a fire started in my town of Ashland. Luckily for me, the strong winds took the fire away from my house, but unfortunately, the fire ravaged the two neighboring towns of Talent and Phoenix. People had minutes to evacuate. 600 homes and 100 businesses were burnt to the ground. Some of my friends evacuated and one rode it out in a Walmart parking lot with other frightened strangers. We went to bed with the shades open, kind of sleeping, but mostly watching. We were building a house and my electrician working that day was not allowed to go back to his home in Talent. His family evacuated and were at a campsite. He spent the night at a friend's in Ashland. The following day, the fire was mostly controlled, and he walked a few miles to his house since the roads were closed. He recounted the walk as a hellish scene, with numerous natural gas fires flaring. He said the gas fires continued for at least 24 hours before the gas was finally shut off. His account of the aftermath and a simple look at the videos of his ruined town paints a clear picture of the contribution fossil fuels play in a fire like this. Propane tanks on mobile homes, vehicle fuel tanks, home heating oil tanks, and natural gas utilities all exacerbate fires like this. 
Structures that may not have burned get reduced to ash because of the mower gas in the garage, the propane tank on the grill, the gasoline in the car tanks, etc. Mobile home parks in Talent and Phoenix were nearly 100% destroyed as many propane explosions could be heard. As climate change continues to exact its pound of flesh from all of us, we need to put an effort into removing all fossil fuels from every aspect of our lives, not just our cars. There are viable electric options for everything. All lawnmower equipment has electric options, all tools, home heating and cooling, cooking, hot water, etc. We need to walk away from all things fossil fuels if we have any hope of saving what's left of this planet. Thanks for listening, Tim in Oregon. And Tim, I'm so sorry about what's happening in your community. And let's move on to the results of our poll. <laughs> We asked, why did Elon and Herbert Deese meet in Germany? Yeah, what was the number one answer? Um, well, I was pretty um, upset that only 32% of you thought that they were playing Parcheesi. Um, the highest uh, rated answer was that they were discussing a partnership about Volkswagen using superchargers. The next highest answer was that Elon just likes EVs and wanted to try out the ID3 and ID4. And the third highest was that they were discussing a partnership about battery production. Again, our viewers are smart. They got it right. They obviously were talking about superchargers. It could have been a bug. It, it could have been a bug, and we can't prove that it was otherwise. Time will tell. All right, it's time for supercharger reviews, and these are sponsored by our friends at EvanX, the Tesla community's accessory store. If you're looking for awesome accessories for your Tesla, then check out EvanX and use our discount code now you know to save you ten dollars on purchases over a hundred. Hello, second testy. This is Holger from Austria again. I'm here in Slovenia at Ljubljana Supercharger. It has eight stalls and it, uh, it's near the highway uh, at the hotel, um, so it's very convenient to reach. Uh, I give it a 6 out of 10. Now you know. Hi there, Zach and Jesse. We're at the West Yellowstone Supercharger in Montana. It's an 8 stall and there's a Grey Wolf Inn and Suites across the road over there. Another hotel, Kelly Inn, over that way. Um, there's a little educational center here, uh, the Wolf and Bear Wildlife Center. You can get a uh, bathroom break inside. You have some snacks and uh, souvenirs that you can take home and some ways you can educate your kids or yourself. Um, around here, things like th looks like things are opening back up. There's a McDonald's down the road over there a few other things uh, overall i'd give this a, a nine out of ten it's the best one for getting around in yellowstone and all right now you know hey zach and jesse we're here at the yuba city supercharger it's a 10 stall supercharger v2 and for amenities we have new york market nearby restrooms food and then we also behind that have Bel Air Shopping Center uh, with other amenities. Overall, it's a very nice location. It's halfway between Sacramento and Chico, so it's a perfect location and good amenities. So I would have to give this one that 8 out of 10. Enjoy. Hey, Zach. Hey, Jesse. We're down here in Asheville, North Carolina. We have a Pretty high traffic supercharger here. We've seen the whole lineup here today. Model Y, got a nice Model X down there. We're charging up the Model 3. Oh, it's a good charger. It's at the Asheville Outlets. So over there, there's all sorts of outlets, sports stores, restaurants, everything. And the best part about this charger is it's just outside the mountains, so you can go hiking just 20 minutes away and you can be hiking in the mountains. So overall, it's a great charger and I, I would say I'd give it an eight out of 10. Anyways. Now you know. Thank you so much, guys. That was great. And we've got some more prettiest superchargers in the world. All right, where's Thank this one? goodness. This one is from Hope, British Columbia. Thank you so much to our viewer, Somi, who shared this picture with us. That is pretty. That is pretty. It's got the mountains. 
It's nice. It's got the mount. It's got, it's got a it's got a supercharger. Yeah. A big points for superchargers. Nice photo too. Yeah. All right. What do we got for new superchargers in the world? So wait, there's new superchargers in the world. There's just Almost they're just week. appearing. Here That's we go. What happens. All right. Number twenty in Taiwan. Taiwan's tiny. They have twenty. Four stall version three in New Taipei City at Zizhi in Taiwan. The 12 stall 250 kilowatt in Nashville at Old Hickory Boulevard in Tennessee. The eight stall version three in Lady Lake, Florida. Number 543 in Europe is the 12 stall 250 kilowatt in Berlin at the EU REF campus in Germany. And number 882 in the USA, number 1953 in the world is the eight stall version three at Chillicote, Ohio. So we're getting close to 2000 superchargers here. We're only weeks away. It is true. And they just they just keep making them. Yeah. And there's just more and more and more every single week. I remember when we started, there were under a thousand, I believe. Yeah. And I mean when we you were see, like six hundred. When you see the map of what we did in twenty sixteen when we drove Sparky across country, it does look like we're kind of crazy. It was sparse. Yeah, because I mean lo- if lots- one of those chargers had been out, I know we would be there now still. Now you have choices. But before <laughs> yes. in Kansas, we had no choice. Yeah, that's very true. All right, it's time for our Patreon giveaway. And uh, we're giving away a poster. It's apropos that it's a Tesla parking only poster. Nice. And to get to this big barrel of fun, become a Patreon. And the more you support us, the more chance you have to win. So who's our winner this week, Jess? The winner is Alex Taylor. Congratulations. Congratulations, Alex. Alex. Back into the big barrel of fun here. And you've made it to the end of the show. And we wanted to talk about a fun thing that we're going to do. Oh, yeah. On Patreon, we are going to start ourselves a little... Investing In, club. Yeah. We're going to try it. We're uh, going to give it a shot. Yeah. So, um, because I know a lot of you write to us every week about either newbie questions about like, how do you invest? How do I do it? Or, you know, experience questions of like, when should I get out? Or what other companies are there? And, and sometimes so, you bring us uh, companies that we oh, yeah. haven't heard of before and we're like, no, because the advantage of an investing club isn't that like we're the smartest people in the world. It's that you get a room of people together who can bounce ideas off of each other and you all come up with much better strategies. So we're going to be doing that on Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, if you'd like to go over to Patreon and join at the $10 level, you can join us on that Zoom call and we'll be talking about all things investment questions. No questions are too dumb. And uh, maybe we'll make a lot of money. Who knows? So <laughs> you can join us on that because... We need our patrons. Uh, without them, without your support, this show doesn't happen. I just want to point out, this is our full gig, like full-time right. gig. Uh, we, th- This show was how many slides long? Um, 137 slides. So yeah. think of a PowerPoint uh, presentation with 137 slides, and you make it in one week. And then you do that again the next week and the next week. And the next week. So this is literally a full-time gig on top of all of the other things that we are trying to bring you on this channel, which are interviews with uh, police uh, chiefs who yeah, have I mean, bought Teslas. We had to drive down to Connecticut to get that story for you. Like, right. it took us all day. Sometimes we do uh, other interviews. Sometimes we're, we're, we're usually doing a lot of different research and a lot of different things. We don't necessarily bring everything to the table here. So, and, oh, and we do in-depth right. every week. So, uh... Without the Patreon support, we would definitely not be able to do this ourselves. We're about to hit video 1,000. Did you know that? 1,000 videos. Yeah. In... About five years. Five years. Yeah. And you might be saying, well, how is it possible even for two people to do that? Uh, There's not two people doing that. We have a team of editors, people who are... You might be saying, like, how do you have such up-to-date news? It's because we've recorded this uh, yesterday at 4 p.m. And it got out to you today... A full one hour video. It took us three hours to record it. It took all week to get it ready. Um, and then it has to be edited in one day and and brought to you. So that way the news isn't cold. No. You, gotta, you don't hot, want cold news. Hot, you, want this, you want this hot, fresh from the oven news brought to you every day. And it's made possible by our amazing patrons. Thank you so much. We can't do it without you. If you want to support us on Patreon, we've got perks. We've got great perks for you to check out. Head over to Patreon. Check them all out. See you next week. Now you know.